This is gonna be everything you need to know to enhance your wrestling conditioning. I'm gonna run through elite versus sub elite wrestlers, what really makes a high level wrestler in terms of conditioning. We're gonna cover some of the programming, some of the confusion around low versus high intensity or zone two or aerobic training and anaerobic training. We're gonna dive into all of that in this video so you have a clear understanding of what to do going forward. Let's start with this 2011 study. Now, why do we compare elite level competitors to their sub elite or amateur counterparts is because if a physical quality is greater in the elite sub or elite cohort, then that means that physical quality is likely important to success in that sport. A really good example of this is within the agility research, you see sub elite athletes are typically as good or better at change of direction speed, but when you add the sport specific stimulus to react to, the elite athletes or elite players are far better than the sub elite counterparts. So we use the same analysis when we're looking at conditioning. And in this study, 2011 study, they had 92 wrestlers from five different countries. They categorized them as elite or amateur. Elite wrestlers had greater than six years of experience and they had competed in at least or three or more Europeans or world championships, whereas the amateur wrestlers were finalists at national championships, so they had not competed internationally. And they put them all through a Wingate test, so if you're not familiar, a Wingate test is a 30 second all out sprint on a bike, or if it's doing upper body, it's with an arm crank. They're brutal, a lot of people throw up after doing them just because of how much it spikes lactate. If you've never done them before, don't do it on an empty stomach. But essentially, the elite wrestlers in this study had greater upper and lower average power and peak power during these tests, and that was over every single weight class. So in this instance, it was light, middle, and heavy. And they put that down to potentially the elite cohort had 3 to 5% uh, greater fat-free mass. So fat-free mass is not muscle mass. However, it does include muscle mass. So you know it could be genetic freaks that are wider, broader, quote unquote bigger boned but often that is down to a muscle mass thing when you're having three to five percent greater fat free mass so even though we're talking about fat free mass or muscle mass and that's just geared more towards the strength training you can obviously watch my strength training for wrestling video it still brings us to conditioning especially when we're talking about average and peak power on the bike and the arm crank so then we get into an even larger study and this one was a meta-analysis they compiled 71 studies 2,124 wrestlers and they wanted to answer the question what are the physiological determinants that governs wrestling success and what they found was VO2 max or aerobic capacity was similar to karate taekwondo and boxing and they conclude that you know a high aerobic capacity is important for wrestling success so having some kind of base there is important then we see anaerobic power so again from the previous study anaerobic power is typically measured with the Wingate test it's greater in wrestling than in judo, boxing, and karate. And then we see, as conclusions from the other study, upper and lower anaerobic power from that wing test is higher in elite wrestlers versus sub-elite wrestlers. So we can conclude from what we see here, you need some kind of base level of aerobic fitness uh, or lower level conditioning, and then you need to be able to display high levels of explosive efforts and typically be able to repeat that within wrestling matches to a greater extent than you would judo, boxing, or karate in these instances. But what does that mean? How does this all come together? How does a conditioning plan come together for a wrestler? Again, it's gonna be a lot depending on your life schedule. Often wrestling, especially here in the States, is done through colleges and high schools, so that in those programs already, there are seasons and everything there. But I'm gonna take you through, maybe you are in submission wrestling, submission grappling, where a lot of this stuff still applies. So we're gonna start with the general overview of how I see it working, then we'll dive into some, a few of the individual things that you may need to consider when you're looking at conditioning. Now, if you're further away from a season or maybe you're just doing tournaments, this is where you'll essentially start on this end of a, the funnel, of course, a funnel system or a high-low system. So starts here and comes together. And I'll explain that now. So you have your low intensity work down the bottom here and you have your higher intensity work up the top. The further away you are from competition or fight, you typically want to sit your conditioning at the very low end down here and at the very high end. And what do I mean by high and low in these instances? So low intensity conditioning will be your typical steady state cardio or your long high intensity intervals or even in some cases some kind of tempo training. So <clears throat> it's work that targets central adaptations or adaptations at the heart. And the goal here is to build enough volume 
of essentially the heart chamber being filled with blood to provide that stretch. The adaptations you're looking at at the heart are called eccentric hypertrophy and it's essentially making the heart chamber bigger so it can pull more blood in there. Whether this is a limiting factor within combat sports, debatable, but again, aerobic capacity is important within wrestling as per the research papers there and having a base is important. So starting there, you're targeting more central adaptations. You are still getting peripheral or muscular adaptations at lower intensities, especially within capillary density. So they still don't know whether it's high or low intensity that's really pushing that. However, you're gonna do both anyway, so who cares? So you're gonna do low steady state or long uh, high intensity intervals here. Up top here, you can consider that sprint interval or a lactic power, whatever you wanna call it. So this is gonna be your six to 10 second maximal sprints and you're gonna have full recovery. And by full recovery, we're talking like two to three minutes plus. And it's typically like a one to six work to rest ratio on a minimum. Typically you wanna go a little further than that just because you want to be able to recover fully between every effort. So in this instance, you wanna track uh, average power during those reps or have some kind of metric that you're measuring and you wanna make sure you don't see a huge drop off in your sprints. So for example, if you're on a bike or a rower and you have 300 watts average, you don't wanna drop typically lower than 10%. So if you get to rep five and you hit 250 watts on average, you know, that session is done. You don't want quality to suffer on these reps and it should all be based around maximal intent and maximal effort. And that's how you're going to start your conditioning. Everything else in the middle here gets taken care of during wrestling practice. However, as you get closer to a competition or a fight or a tournament, whatever you're doing, you're gonna kind of marry some of these things together. And it's gonna be more repeat high intensity effort base. And that's the ability to repeat high intensity intervals. So here we were doing some lower intensity intervals or steady state up here we were doing our high intensity stuff with longer rest now essentially we're going to do high intensity work with less rest to put it very simply and the goals here are we're going to push more of these peripheral adaptations within the muscle help them resist fatigue as we're wrestling now there's some great research from andrew Ashley. you should check out it's actually in boxing but I believe it, it gives some insight into all combat sports as well, even the podcast with uh, Ed Baker that is on the Sweet Arts of Fighting podcast YouTube channel. He also talks about how combat sports are likely more limited from peripheral fatigue than it is from centrally or from these uh, aerobic adaptations within the heart. So therefore doing things like this where we can improve the muscle's ability to resist fatigue is likely important for wrestling and how do these look these are typically maximal or near maximal sprints typically on and off feet cardio equipment and you're going to do these from anywhere from 10 to 30 to 40 seconds of work and you're going to rest a similar time within that so it's typically almost a one-to-one -one work to rest once you get down here however these will be maximal and near maximal efforts versus something down here when you're doing very low intensity efforts that's just, that's essentially how the funnel system goes now there are Important considerations to make, and that is you know, how far out you are from competition, um, muscle fiber type, or whether you're more predominantly fast twitch explosive, slower twitch workhorse, quote unquote. I think those are important things to also remember in these certain areas of your training. Especially when we look at muscle fiber type, you're looking at slower twitch athletes recovering faster after hard efforts. Fast twitch athletes take five plus hours to recover, if not longer. So if you're doing multiple high intensity sessions you're going to dig yourself into a hole and increase your risk of injury lower the quality of your technical training sessions etc so that's something just to be aware of whether you are a most people are a hybrid but whether you're a very slow twitch or very fast twitch wrestler you likely have an idea just based on your style um, compared to some other people as well some other factors to be aware of is how much wrestling you're actually doing because if you're doing a lot of wrestling technical training a lot of this lower intensity work may already be taken care of and adding more volume on top of that may not be getting you to where you want to go again i touched on the idea that perhaps the peripheral fatigue is what is the limiting factor in most people i tend to believe it is i think once you have that little that base of aerobic conditioning typically you're looking at if we look at if we extrapolate some of the research, if you know anything about maximal aerobic speed, 
which is essentially doing a five or six minute time trial running cycling or rowing you take that distance you divide it by the time you did it in seconds and it will give you a meters per second score and typically anything above i think it's 4.5 to 4.8 meters per second then you're typically good i see i've tended to find that in most athletes once you get into that 4.5 meters per second you're actually pretty okay regarding aerobic or low intensity development you're potentially better off focusing more on the high intensity repeat effort training doesn't mean you completely discard what's happening down here but it means you may put less emphasis on what's happening down there and more on the high intensity work here are just some example like sessions or guidelines you can follow for some of these i'm not going to give absolutely everything that could be within that funnel it's just going to get way too confusing when you have so many options so here are just four of those options the ones that i talked about on the funnel in the previous uh whiteboard image but essentially the steady state cardio very simple 30 minutes for example at a slow and steady pace typically you should be able to nose breathe throughout and you're looking at if you're looking at heart rate anywhere from 120 to 150 beats per minute i would gear more towards on the lower end of that um, you can do these doing any kind of modality but typically the adaptations happen peripherally on the muscles being worked so if you're just sitting on the bike for those 30 minutes then those adaptations peripherally mainly happen in the legs where the upper body doesn't get much and especially in a sport like wrestling you probably want some of those upper body adaptations so you know using a rower uh, or skierg might be a better option in that regard um, you can even do solo drills uh, wrestling drills in these 30 minutes that works really well uh, can be difficult to keep your heart rate down when you're doing those however you can even do a circuit of them you can do five minutes of solo drills jump on a off feet cut equipment for 10 minutes come back to solo drills etc so there's lots of variation you can do within that typically works well more towards you could say quote unquote recovery style workouts uh, just because it is low intensity facilitates blood flow etc however you will use these initially just to develop uh, some of that base uh, then you have long high intensity interval training so you could say quote unquote more specific to wrestling so two to eight times two to eight minutes and if you know your maximal aerobic speed which i explained previously 90 percent of that or even 95 um, or you can just go by heart rate 80 to 95 percent of your max heart rate uh, you could do these with re wrestling specific drills too especially if you have a partner uh, you could just kind of do a technique back and forth uh, or two two um, or you can do it on off-feet cardio equipment as well. You could also do that solo drills too, because solo drills, uh, at least shadow wrestling, you can get a relatively high intensity of work um, compared to you know someone who's shrimping down the mat in jujitsu. So that's definitely an option there as well. Now, why would you choose a long high intensity over steady state? Or typically you're not choosing one over the other. You might be using both within a training week, uh, especially initially. Uh, typically... The steady state stuff is lower intensity, so you're not going to have more of that fatigue running over, but you're going to get more of a chronic stretch in the heart with that blood pooling. So if you're looking to primarily target those central adaptations, yeah, up here is where you want to be. Down here, if you want a little bit more intensity, uh, I guess you could say, I don't want to say more peripheral adaptation, but typically that's what we're seeing within the research. But yeah, both are good options to use initially. Then you're going to do on your higher end, your alactic power, I explained this before, 6 to 10 seconds, 2 to 3 minutes rest until your power drops off on whatever you're doing. Uh, this doesn't have a certain number of sets prescribed to it. It can do, but it's much better to go by once you lose that 10% decrement in the average power that you might be tracking doing whatever you're doing that's when you stop your set uh, you can do these doing I mean, you can even do these doing sprints i wouldn't advise it for a non-running athlete like a wrestler but it is something you can do and then your sprint intervals when we're getting more towards that repeat high intensity efforts different to, re to repeat sprint ability which is often used in the research there is a much more quote unquote anaerobic demand here uh, versus just sprinting so typically you see in the research repeated sprint ability you can improve by improving a lot of the aerobic energy system through steady state cardio but once you start adding in other things other than running it becomes a little more tricky so you're looking at you know, 10 to 40 seconds 10 to 60 seconds rest is a pretty easy one to do or one to one uh, is a simple one there as well you can go anywhere from 5 to 20 sets in this depending on overall training load etc i can't give exact uh, prescription on that because it just depends but a good place to start is 10 sets 
and you can kind of progress from there or change it from there. And just a quick note on energy systems, we can do some labels like energy systems, uh, they're often just labels, so you, know, you can't just isolate energy system. you can't just do pure aerobic training or pure anaerobic training, everything works together, however sometimes it can just be easier to label things as you know, aerobic energy system training or alactic energy system training, so just bear that in mind that everything works together. It's better I think to think about it as maybe we're targeting more central versus more peripheral adaptations. Um, and that's based on an intensity spectrum. So intensity is the main driver of the adaptations you're going to get. The volume will dictate how much of that you're gonna get. And you wanna start with the minimum volume you can and then build from there to make progress. That way you're not shooting yourself in the foot, coming out and doing 20 plus sets of whatever it is or starting with two hour runs for your steady state cardio, then you have no room to move. So hopefully that made your wrestling conditioning a little clearer. Please make sure to like and subscribe and I'll bring you more videos just like this.